Thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Atlas. Today's guest is Alex Epstein, best-selling author and philosopher who focuses primarily on the moral issues around energy policy. He's the author of several books, including The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, now a decade ago, a New York Times bestseller, arguing that human flourishing requires that humanity uses more fossil fuels, not less. His most recent book is Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. Alex and I have a conversation about energy policies, eliminating fossil fuels, forcing electric vehicles onto consumers, and other issues that have become dogmas among leftists and progressive policymakers, the media, and among many of America's youth. To a point where even questioning these ideas provokes cancellation and attack. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned. Hi, it's uh, great to see you. And uh, one of the things that's so sort of interesting to me about this, as many things have become almost strikingly parallel to the pandemic, which I was uh, involved with, uh, and I think your field, the drive to push wind and solar power, electric vehicles, and eliminate oil and natural gas, the parallels are right there in terms of denying facts, ignoring basic common sense, and more and more ignoring the data. I want to go back to your your first book uh, that really uh, made such an impression, which was now a decade ago, which is sort of amazing. Yeah. That it's been so long, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And, you know, your premise uh, is sort of obvious, but it, and it's amazing it has to even be said. But basically, using fossil fuels is a moral issue. Let's, for our uh, viewers, why don't you explain that thesis? When we're looking at fossil fuels, we're failing to consider the enormous benefits. And, and the parallel I noticed to COVID is when you fail to consider the enormous benefits of something, you fa are failing to consider the costs of restricting it. And what Absolutely. I saw with COVID was everyone was only talking about the benefits of restricting human activity in the name of this one virus. We'll get back to the obsession with one virus, but they weren't talking about the costs. And it turns out the cost of limiting the freedom of human beings to interact with one another is an apocalyptically high cost. And, and so the I biggest saw, example, saw, yeah, the biggest example really was closing schools where you had uh, the facts showed that children were not even at significant risk for healthy children for serious illness but the, the damage from isolating young people was enormous uh, and uh, I think obvious, just like the idea of just simply eliminating low-cost, easily available energy. And I think, I think one thing that, there's a question of why did this happen? Right. And I think with, with um, and, and there are some parallels, that, like in terms of fear. Now, the thing with COVID that actually made the anti-fossil fuel people jealous is that you had something that people were truly afraid of. And in a sense, there was much more, there's infinitely more reason, I think, to be of, uh, afraid of a, you know, a novel coronavirus that people don't have pre existing immunity to. There's a lot more reason to be afraid of that, which doesn't mean overreact, but it means afraid of that versus very slow changes in the global climate system when we have lots of technology and resilience to deal with those things and lots of time to change and stuff like that. Yeah. But it, it seems, if I can, it can interrupt. Because I'm I'm a I'm a novice with a totally non-expert with with the energy field, but it just seems as a regular person, there is an overt attempt to instill fear. Yes, yeah. I mean that's the strategy. Right, right. But it and, and, and it works. It works actually tragically with younger people the most, because younger people can buy this simple model of the world where like we all depend on some stable climate. And that's what we somehow had in 1850. Like we had the perfect climate in 1850, even though everyone was living till 30 and dying in droves of climate. That was somehow the perfect. And they didn't even like the climate then. They thought it was too cold because they were still in a little ice age or they're just coming out of it. Um, but like they had the perfect climate. And then if humans impact the climate, the climate gets broken. And then it's this climate god that's mad at us. And then it ruins everything and we can't live. And, and the more you're young, the more that model makes sense. And now people do hold that model in an older, when they're older, but it doesn't have the same existential fear. Cause you know, they're living 
they're quote unquote living with climate change all the time. There are nice days, there are non nice days, but they're not really dying. And so it has a kind of fake, fake quality to it where everyone will say existential threat, which means a threat to our existence, but they don't really mean it. I mean, you can see like, okay, Elizabeth Warren flying in a private jet is one kind of example of this, but just people, adults talking about this are not really living in fear. Whereas when it's an unfamiliar, again, new virus, and you may, you know, particularly you may be somebody in one of the risk categories, or you, you there's a lot right. of uncertainty about it. That's much more of a reason to be to be afraid. And I think what happened then is people took advantage of that fear to to um, to operate on a totally false value. And this is going to there's going to be a parallel to fossil fuels here, but the value that people were operating on, or the moral goal people were were operating on, was eliminate this one virus or the risk of this one virus at all costs. That was 100% the goal that most of our leaders were operating on, right? Eliminate the risk of right. this one virus at all costs. Now, if you say that, if you make that explicit, how could you possibly ever have that as a goal, right? You can't. I mean, even if you say like eliminate health risks at all, at all costs, that's better. Although, of course, you're not considering the health risk of not being productive, not interacting, et cetera. But this fixation on one thing is completely logically indefensible. And this is the kind of thing you were pointing yeah. out. And, and but, ethically and ethically indefensible. Yeah, but they're, just they're, logically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean it's 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 related. I'm just stressing it because yes, it, it exactly. pretends to be scientific. Completely agree. It, it's 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 total pseudoscience. But what happened is people had this Puritan goal of reduce the risk of this one virus uh at all costs. Leaving aside the, the scientific conclusions around that, that is a totally invalid goal. And right. because people who were some people who were scientific specialists adopted that goal, that goal itself was considered scientific. And, and you see the exact same thing. Just let me make the parallel to fossil fuels. Is sure. the number one political goal in the world today, if you look at what most governments advocate, businesses advocate, financial institutions advocate, is eliminating our impact on climate by 2050. That's what net zero means. Like Net zero 2050. But think about that. Why... Even if you're concerned about our impact on climate more than I am, why would that be your number one goal? Notice nobody's saying global human flourishing by 2050. Nobody's saying global availability of energy by 2050, even though we have 3 billion people using less electricity than a typical U.S. refrigerator. Instead, they're they're monomaniacally obsessed on let's stop impacting climate as if the world is going to be good as long as we don't have any impact on climate. Doesn't doesn't make any sense. But they've they've asserted this false value. And part of the way they've done that is by creating this inordinate, although somewhat fake, fear. They've said, right. if you don't do this, you're all going to die. And so you don't you don't have the levity to step back and say, okay, what's the real threat here? What's the cost of dealing with it in different ways? What are the other variables to consider? I think that's what I became attracted to your thinking with COVID because it's very parallel to mine. And hey, let's consider the big picture here. Let's right. let's weigh things carefully. And let's think through the implications of everything. And people didn't do that with COVID and they didn't do that with fossil fuels. And anyone can recognize that. You don't have to know about scientific errors to recognize that people are ignoring the benefits of fossil fuels. And they're right. just looking at the negative, alleged negative climate side effects. And this is, this is, I think, part of what, I think it's a big part of what you do. Uh, it, it's about how to think about this stuff. It's not yeah. just the facts. I mean, and we can, and I want to talk about how facts don't even matter to many people anymore, and we can't ever disregard the facts, but there's something about simply thinking through something or what I would call being a critical thinker, contemplating what the positives of things are, but also what the harms of what you want to do are. Uh, the other thing I want to mention here before we get off of this basic moral morality uh i want to i want to focus on that a little bit because the parallels again are striking to me the morality the ethical uh sort of construct here is that we don't care what happens to developing nations low income families and this is exactly the same of what happened with the shutdowns the lockdowns the interruptions of supply chain the the destruction of not only the poor nations by the lockdowns of COVID, but also the sacrificing of the so-called essential workers to benefit the affluent during the lockdowns. And in energy policy, you know, the, the once you start cutting off availability of fossil fuels, 
you, you've destroyed these developing nations. Correct me if I'm wrong there. No, it's it's another exact parallel. And and let me let me show you how it applies in the case of, of climate. Because in well, in the case of COVID, I think you can see the people who the COVID catastrophists, but but really let's just say the like the lockdowners, because that's the more uh, essential thing. Even if even if the COVID poses a catastrophic kind of risk, locking down everyone is not the way to deal with that kind of uh, a risk. You want people to be free to innovate and, and to adapt in all sorts of, of different ways, including, I mean, we can talk about how. Sure. It's kind of similar, actually, where they, they claim, hey, we want an alternative, we want a solution, and yet they're so, like, the government institutions are so anti-freedom in terms of innovation. And we see the same thing with right. the people who claim to care about climate and CO2 of being opposed to nuclear energy and not allowing that to develop. But it, it, you just take what happened with COVID, the people claiming, you know, advocating basically COVID zero lockdown as as the policy they claim to care about the poor and downtrodden but if you notice their exclusive sliver of concern was how is covid going to affect the people but that's not the way to be concerned about somebody is just to be concerned with one sliver the the way to be concerned is to look at the full context of relevant variables that affect somebody and affect like for instance their health and their overall well-being. It doesn't benefit your health and your overall well-being to be poor and for the economy to be poor and for essential health services to be shut down because everyone's afraid of interacting with everyone. And you notice the same fake concern with climate because you'll you'll see something like a uh, disaster, you know, some climate related disaster in Pakistan or something like that. You'll see a, a climate disaster in Pakistan and maybe a thousand people will die from that disaster. And people say, I care so much about these Pakistanis. I care so much about them. This is why we need to stop using fossil fuels. Like it's just, it's just, it's just because I care about them, right? That's why we're doing it. But then wait a second, you look at, well, on the one hand, these Pakistanis are way safer from climate disasters than they were several decades ago, in part because they've developed using fossil fuels. And then if you go to a place like the United States that's developed using fossil fuels, we're incredibly resilient, so we wouldn't have anywhere near that death total. And those fossil fuels not only make you resilient from climate danger, but they also allow your whole economy to be good. So can you really say that you care about the Pakistanis uh, by destroying the thing that's protecting them now and the thing they need to protect themselves more and the thing they need to be better off in general? No, you don't actually care about them. You just have an agenda where you're monomaniacally fixated on this one thing. And and you're pretending that that it's a human thing, but it's not. It's it's not a pro-human thing, and this is key. Then this is particularly true with the fossil fuel issue with COVID. It's a little more mixed, yeah. I think. Yeah. With the fossil fuel issue, the people who are genuinely obsessed with with eliminating our impact on climate are generally also obsessed with eliminating our impact on nature as such, and that is not a pro-human thing. That is an anti-human thing because human beings survive by and flourish by impacting nature. So anyone who has a hostility toward human impact on nature, including anyone who thinks it's just wrong to impact the climate and we shouldn't be able to do anything that impacts the climate, even though we need fossil fuels impact the climate some and we need them to live, like you are not pro-human. You're anti-human impact, which ultimately means you're anti-human because to be against the impact of something is to be against the thing. Just like if you had a movement that was anti-bear impact, those people want to kill all the bears. And so you right. need to not allow these people to pretend that they're pro-human by biopically claiming to care about one little aspect of life. We have to look holistically. No, you're destroying the thing that makes us safe from climate and that makes every other aspect of life. Right. As you wrote in your in your book in 2014, the quote that I have written here is you said, human life is the standard of value not in the le less impact on the environment. It's actually yeah. what the impact is on human life itself. And, you know, I think this is so important and so so basic, fundamental to understanding the trade-offs and the, and the whole perspective on this issue. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, you know, I'll call human life. I use often the term human flourishing just to capture the full nature of a successful life. So, you know, it has like obviously material elements, mental elements, uh, et cetera, like flourishing is living to your highest potential. And the contrast is this comes up in the contrast where we're thinking about global issues or environmental issues. We're thinking about a lot of people and their different kinds of impacts. And the question is, are you evaluating good and bad outcomes by the standard of does this advance human flourishing on earth? So does it make the world a place where people can have longer 
healthier, more opportunity-filled lives? Is it that perspective? Or is your perspective eliminating human impact on Earth? You you <laughs> think a better Earth is an Earth that has less human impact. And I submit this is why people think climate change, so to speak, is a crisis. Because if you look at the facts, I, I've documented this, and nobody, still nobody has refuted this. Many have tried, but uh, this is just uh, primary source data about disasters. The, the rate of disaster death from climate, so storms and floods and heat, et cetera, that's declined by 98% over the last century as fossil fuel use and CO2 emissions and C CO2 levels have increased. And the reason is that our ability to master climate danger, so to deal with any kind of climate danger, which fossil fuels make possible by powering all of our machines, that ability has far outpaced any increase in right. climate challenges. So who cares if we're changing climate some and creating some new challenges if our ability to deal with challenges is far Yes. Uh, pacing that, but yet people think we're in a climate crisis, including people who know that we're safer than ever. So that this is a moral issue. There's it's not a scientific issue. It's they think the world is worse climate wise because they're not evaluating it by human flourishing on Earth. They're evaluating it by human impact is evil, and more impact means worse. So they they want a world where we're more endangered from climate, but the climate is more natural. And I think this goes to to another part of this, which is. Not only is that morality uh, really antithetical to what you would think people would want generally, but their policies themselves actually create problems. Uh, this net zero policy, and I think you've outlined this many times, net zero emissions causes huge problems like power shortages, et cetera. So it's destructive. It's just well, like why the lockdowns. You? But yeah, but why wouldn't it be? So if you think about it as good policy involves considering the full context of relevant factors, including like the unique benefits of a technology like fossil fuels, which is the only way we have of producing energy right now that's affordable, reliable, versatile, so ever able to power every type of machine and then scalable to billions of people in thousands of places. If you ignore those unique benefits and you claim, oh, no, we can rapidly replace them with unreliable solar wind, even though the evidence shows that we can't even do it for electricity, let alone all forms of energy. Right. If you are a fossil fuel benefit denier and you make policy on the basis of that, you are going to deny people benefits. And those benefits, one of them you mentioned is just, I think you mentioned the reliability of the grid. So we're seeing uh, almost unprecedented electricity shortages in the United States. I was, in fact, just on a meeting right before this with some electricity experts, and they were saying one of the big trends, and this is true, one of the big trends in the country is that area after area is saying no to new promising economic development projects because they don't have enough power. Now, think about this. When did Thomas Edison create the modern grid? Like, how embarrassed would he be if 100 years later he learned that, wait, the electricity industry, even though we know how to generate electricity really easily at low cost, like we already know how to do this. We've known for a long time. It can't service new data centers in this kind of thing. That's because we have fossil fuel benefit denial. And, and unfortunately, um, in terms of the consequences, to deny the benefit of cost-effective and scalable energy is to ultimately deny every human benefit. Because every human benefit, healthcare, sanitation, scientific progress, technological progress, AI, they all depend on energy being cost-effective and scalable because the more cost-effective and scalable energy is, the more cost-effective and scalable it is to use machines. And every aspect of life is better if we can use machines to amplify and expand our abilities. And I think the, the AI thing is helping to Create is helping to expose the problems with our grid. The EV thing is too, although EV thing is more of an artificial phenomenon promoted by government. The AI is more of a of a market phenomenon. But what we're seeing is we're we're fossil fuel benefit denying, so we're reducing the supply of reliable electricity, and then we're increasing the demand for reliable electricity. And of course, that's causing problems, and and people are barely starting to wake up to this. But it's it all it all comes from the bad thinking and the bad values lead to bad policy that lead to bad consequences. Right. And, and this is very difficult because we're talking about how to fundamentally think about things. Uh, and, and that, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit frustrated with that, but some of these things are seem so obvious, yet they're denied. I mean, well, I, I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion on how to be less frustrated with it. 
uh, okay, which, let's which hear. Is, I talk about this in chapter 11 of, of, of fossil future. And then on, um, if people check out, uh, energy talking points.com or Alex Epstein.substack.com, you can see a lot of free articles about framing stuff. So the, you say some of this is like, it's so kind of obvious that this is the right way to think about it and that the wrong way is the wrong way. And it's the same thing with COVID. Like, how could you ever think you, you should only be trying to reduce the risk of one virus and ignore all the costs of that? That's insane. But what I found is that if something is insane like that, the way to, to counter it is to frame explicitly the right way and the wrong way of thinking at the outset. Because what happens is if you frame the right way and the wrong way of thinking, you say, well, of course, with, with energy, don't we need to carefully weigh the benefits and side effects of different forms of energy? We can't just look at the negative side effects of fossil fuels, right? And every single person I've ever asked will say yes. So once you give them the common sense thing, they will agree to it. And then to some extent, at least, they'll follow it. They're much more likely to follow it if you frame the conversation around the right way of thinking or the right assumptions and the right values. You can often get them to agree to that, and then they'll process the facts differently. But if you just jump in with the facts or you just expect them to think about it carefully, they've been, they've been been their thinking has been so distorted by the prevailing way of thinking. So people are incredibly good at adopting terrible thinking methods, even if they're very smart, when thinking methods are left implicit. But when you make thinking methods explicit by framing conversations around them, it helps a lot. Okay, I'm going to try that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me know how it, how it goes. You know, you know I, I wanted to talk about how, uh, how compelling it is when you speak, uh, particularly on campuses. I think that this is really critical. You know, we need to pay attention to what people that are under 30 are thinking uh, you you use a phrase energy freedom. That's what you. Yeah. I, I think you like to talk about energy policy should be based on this concept of energy freedom. L l tell me what you mean by that and and how how that works when you talk about that in groups. Energy freedom is is my current focus. So people often ask, "Are you working on a new book?" And the answer is, "I'm working on something that will end up in a book." But I'm really working on on a new energy policy for. The United States, uh, and because I think that we're when you're advocating, you know, when you're at, well, this is one of my issues with COVID that came up. Like, if something, if if the policy is bad, it's not enough just to criticize the bad policy; it's to say what is the right policy. Absolutely. And sometimes it's hard to figure out. So, for example, with nuclear energy, nuclear energy has enormous potential. It's crippled by terrible, irrational, pseudoscientific government policies. But when I ask the pro-nuclear people or the anti-anti-nuclear people like what to do, I find that they often don't have very clear answers to it. And so my focus has been and will remain for a while is let's get together the best experts, the best researchers, and, and let's either integrate what's already been come up with or come up with new stuff, the policies that will actually transform the world for the better. And, and to get to energy freedom, the fundamental of these is going to be freedom. And the reason is, is because the fundamental of all value creation politically is freedom because all value creation ultimately comes from the human mind thinking and then enacting the thing in reality and then testing out to see how it works and competing, et cetera. And so, you know, just the same thing with medicine. Like why is laser eye surgery improving so much and, and at low cost? Because that's relatively freer than the general kind of health insurance subsidized system Etc. And so, generally, we know when we leave things free, they get higher quality, uh, higher novelty in terms of bringing in new stuff, and lower cost. And so, it's the but same. Do, do you think that that's? Uh, I agree with you a hundred percent. I just want to ask this question though. It seems to me that this whole concept of freedom is not as attractive to everybody as you might think. In fact, we see by their actions things like censorship, things like. Uh, we should, you know, there are surveys, particularly among, as you said, younger people. Uh, you know, it's okay to stop people from talking. It's okay to disinvite people from speaking or to block them from speaking. Uh, information, uh, more information is not the goal. Now it's accusing people of misinformation, disinformation. So freedom, and I'm extrapolating from that to the bigger concept of the whole thing about freedom. I think freedom. it's related. I, I agree. I, I wonder about how attractive how compelling the argument for freedom is in the United States now. I'm glad you're you're raising that because I think it's 
there, there are definitely these kinds of hazards. And I think the key thing is if you're advocating freedom, you need a vision of what the playing out of the freedom looks like. So I'll use your example first, and then I'll translate it to my situation, like the, the freedom of speech kind of, of, of issue. I think it's really important that, that cause the wrong side of these issues, they, they often raise legitimate kinds of concerns. And then they claim that those concerns can only be addressed by their own terrible anti-freedom policy. Yeah, exactly. So it, is, it is, for example, like it is a concern in the world if people are spewing things that are non-factual. It is a concern in the world if people are spewing things that like have irrational that have like kind of irrational prejudices, including racial prejudice. Like there, you know, there's a lot of bad things that people can say, right? And that's 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 a real thing that human beings have to deal with. And and the issue is a free society truly deals with those things in the best possible way because basically they allow total individual curation in the end. So what they don't do, they don't have the hazard of suppressing things that the leaders happen to think is objection are objectionable, but might actually be true. Like abolitionists thought in the slavery era, right? That was that would have been considered misinformation or objection. Like it doesn't deprive. Oh, we saw this over and over again with COVID. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Because we don't have a free society now, but that's an, a right, sort of right. my so own bottom line. It doesn't de- well, it's related though because part of it is the positive of free society is it gives you the best possible opportunity of discovering the truth. And like that's, right. that's one thing you have to say, but it doesn't obligate you to associate with anyone whom you do not trust to provide the truth. And this is where I take issue with some, um, you know, conservatives and stuff who want to control the social media platforms. I don't, and, and say like, well, you have to have equal time and this kind of thing. Like, I don't agree with that. I think that every platform should be able to have its own content policy. I think they should be open about it. They should not pretend that they're actually non-biased if they're biased. But I think basically, like part of a free society is, is this is a whole issue we could talk about, but just to give the outline of my view, like part of a free society is it's voluntary association. So you get you get the benefit of the freedom to, to associate with anyone that you think might have the truth, but you also get the freedom to dissociate with people that that you don't think have the truth, but there's no government that can force you to do either, and you can Absolutely. otherwise change your mind. As long and, as there's a, 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 you know, we can talk about this, but as long as there's a, a, an opportunity to compete and bring in alternatives and you know the barriers of entry, so there therefore there is a problem with monopolistic well, practice. Well, yeah, and that, that so that's another thing where so I don't uh, agree with that as stated, but the. But then my job would be, if I were to convince you of that, I want to get back, uh, but would be to show you, hey, no, actually, if we have a truly free thing, there aren't true barriers to entry in that sense. There are ways right. around. Like, I don't believe in antitrust law, but my obligation in advocating that is to show you a vision of how it plays out. And so right. what happens in all of these things, and you can see this with healthcare generically, where people have this vision of, oh, if, we're, if we had a total free market in healthcare, you know, everyone would starve on the streets where insurance companies would make everything impossibly expensive. And you need to you need to have a vision that addresses anyone's legitimate concerns. And you basically have a have a vision of how the freedom policy works out and then a nightmare vision of how the anti-freedom policy works out. And so it's the same thing with energy. My obligation, whether I'm saying, hey, let's repeal the National Environmental Policy Act or even something like the Endangered Species Act. People think if you don't have an Endangered Species Act, uh, then you can't preserve animals that you find valuable. In fact, Endangered Species Act and many other things prevent us from preserving animals we find valuable. They prevent all sorts of farming efforts, hunting efforts, private preservation, et cetera, and they wreck our economy. But it's my job. I can't just say, hey, let's be free of this law, the end. I have to give you a vision of, of no, if you do it my way, you're actually going to get more of the things you want as a normal human being. It, in, including like good environmental type things, natural beauty, et cetera. And you're going to get less of the other. So that's why it's people, you can't just say freedom and everyone's going to say, yay, I love freedom, blah, blah, blah. No, absolutely. And, and, and you with, have to, I totally agree with and that. And with energy, let me just say one thing about the, the, the main concern with energy is people equate freedom with the unlimited ability to pollute or endanger. And so part of that, and, and that's why they say we need quote unquote regulation and unlimited regulation. That's not, you need, no, but part of freedom is you have laws protecting you from interfering with other people's freedom. 
that's the nature of it, right? It's, it's freedom implies freedom for other people too. And so you can't interfere with their freedom. And part of that is doing demonstrable, significant damage uh, to their health. And so that's that's a pro-freedom thing. But the other side is all, is always going to have a caricature of your side. And so right. part of what you need to do is have a vision that refutes the caricature and actually show that the often the things about the caricature apply to their side. Yeah, let me ask a question uh, because we don't have that much time about the current status these days of these regulations and rules and laws. Uh, I, what I'm getting at is, I, have you seen a significant pushback on uh, some of these restrict, what I call restrictive laws on energy, like the whole thing about natural gas in new buildings, uh, or uh, the, the even the push really against uh, conventional cars and and engines and things like this. And what is the status right now about this? Are are the, is there enough? Is there a pushback on this, or are we having this inexorable progression to more and more restrictions? A lot of the restrictions you're seeing are executive or administrative level type things. So you take a look at the grid, for example, you know, the, the Biden administration is like unilaterally basically saying, we're going to try to shut down as many coal plants as humanly possible, even though the grid is already in what I regard as a crisis state, in part because of previous coal shutdowns, as well as other reliable power plants. So the, the, the kind of worst stuff right now, it's not that Congress... It's not even that Congress and the president combined are passing terrible legislation, although they did with the Inflation Reduction Act. That was really, really bad. Uh, but but like the worst stuff is coming from, you know, at least at the national level, is coming from these executive type decisions. And what you saw with Obama, Trump, Biden, and I'm just talking about energy here. I'm not supporting any sure. candidacy or anything like that. Um, and I certainly do not support either party as a whole. But the but what you saw is, you know, Obama was beginning this anti-fossil fuel slash fossil fuel elimination push. And then Trump did quite a bit, and I think almost all correctly, at the executive level to counter that. And then Biden just came in and countered all of that and just kind of reversed it. And then already you see the signs from Trump, like if he comes in on day one, he's just reversing all of that. So we have this kind of executive back and forth. What we really need is not just that. I mean, all things be equal, you want the executive to to do the right thing, but you really need congressional. Uh, you really need congressional change. And so, what I'm working on is both proposed executive changes, but also congressional changes. Just give you one idea: like the Clean Air Act in the United States, literally does not allow you to consider the cost of implementing any given environmental standard. So you could literally have something that said we need to bring particulate matter 2.5 down to this level of micrograms that would shut down the entire economy, make everyone poor, dr dramatically diminish our life expectancy. And the Clean Air Act says too bad because we can't consider the cost. Like that is the state of policy today. So we right. need radical, radical reform. And you know, culturally, there is a lot of pushback to this. So that that's kind of the good sign is we're seeing- I think on the local level too, at least yeah. where I live in Northern California, uh, even today, I think I read that one of the local uh, city council uh, boards here pushed back on this restriction of new buildings getting natural gas feeds. And then in the same article though, you read how well they're gonna, they're gonna try to get around the pushback. Yeah, I mean, the. We also have to be aware that the fact that we're talking about you're not allowed to use natural gas in a building is so outrageous and so, so beyond the yeah. pale that the fact that there's some pushback is not a sign. It's kind of like with the grid. It should, it's appalling that, it, including Texas, right, that they cannot generate enough reliable electricity. Like this should be, and one of the, the things I think is important for activism and advocacy is to not change your standards, particularly when people should know that your standards are common sense. So my standards are, we should have abundant, reliable electricity. We should not in the modern age be having any kind of problems with electricity. And the fact that we're having them nationwide is an absolute uh, embarrassment. And the idea that you're gonna tell somebody what kind of stove they can use, or that they have to, California, you have to build new buildings with solar panels, even though we have way too much solar at certain times of the day, and not nearly enough at other times of the day, and, and a dictator in effect, in this realm, Gavin Newsom is going to tell you this. Like, 
people need to be much more appalled. And and then that'll help with not only the pushback, but in advocating another uh another right. alternative, it, which is energy freedom. In fact, I'm 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 very concerned that people are so passive. I, I mean, again, lots of things that happened during the pandemic were really exposing problems rather than generated by the pandemic itself. That's my belief. And one of them is how I, I was shocked at how acquiescent Americans were. I understand that there was fear. I understand that there was propaganda. But in the end, uh, I, I, I think it's obvious that we're in a free country. There's an obligation to speak up uh, for things that you, you should know right from wrong and speak up about it. Because if you don't, uh, the consequence is a complete loss of those freedoms. Uh, I agree, and I do agree that that was surprising. It was surprising. I'll just say it was surprising to me how, like, I remember just being so mad when this was happening. And it's like, it was one of the more helpless moments I felt in my life. I remember just being on my electric skateboard, uh, like riding around and just thinking, like, what the hell is happening? Just everyone is acquiescing to this. Almost nobody is speaking up. It's just like, and it's, it's for what in particular we knew pretty early on most of us are yes. not that endangered by this and it's like this is what it is and i think one one power one reason for the the acquiescence is a lot of it was the guilt so some of it was the fear but i suspect even more of it was the guilt was it like if you're advocating for freedom you want to kill grandma right i mean and this was the demonization the the and this is very effective use of propaganda, as we saw. Yeah. And I think the same thing is happening, uh, in my view, uh, again, as an outsider with climate. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a, you're, you're, you're evil if you want to use fossil fuels. You're evil if you want to damage the environment. Uh, you're causing the end of the earth. And uh, I think it's, it's very effective to stop people from speaking out, even when it's, it's, it's common sense everybody or not everybody but many people know it and they're afraid to speak out and and this is really uh it's frightening uh how how impactful propaganda is but that's the reality and then just one final thought again both cases it's surprisingly powerful at least surprising to many power surprisingly powerful to have a very confident positive stance and to say, for example, like my books are titled The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels and Fossil Future. They're not titled Fossil Fuels Aren't As Bad As You Think, which is what the industry, if it wrote a book, historically would title it, right? So, and it's the same thing with COVID. Like people should have said, look, I have a right to live my life and to interact with people that I love. And if people are at risk, then they should interact less. And I'm not going to impose myself on them. I'm not going to be a typhoid Mary or something like that and try to infect them. Uh, but we get to live our lives the way we judge best. We get to raise our children the way we judge best. That is good for our health. That is good for our life. And it's it's our lives. And you guys are you guys should be guilty because you're the one taking away everyone's life, everyone's opportunity. How many countless moments of life, particularly for older people, did you destroy forever where they didn't get to see the people they wanted? How many moments of education and development? You know, I mean, I know kids in this situation where their development sure. is crippled. By this stuff, so yeah, we need like a morally intransigent advocacy of the right policy, not simply being angry at the wrong policy, because that's that gets rid of the guilt. People need to see an example of pride, which I know people will rebel against sometimes, but they need to see pride for the position that's trying to be guilted, not just a little less guilt. And as a yes, I, fossil fuels. I have a sort of an anecdote that I'll close on, but okay. have, it's about myself, which was that. When I did an interview, I was in the White House, so it was in August, I was called up by a reporter and I started talking about how, you know, liberty, freedom, these are things that are very essential to Americans and to uh, quality of life and everything. And the reporter said to me, you know, you're the first person that's ever used the word freedom in an interview about the lockdowns, the principle of freedom. I mean, this is shocking that it was even said to me. So uh, I agree, but, you know, we're, we're trying to speak rationally. And uh, one of the other things that people say to me is one of the big problems I have is I assume that everybody is even thinking along the same construct that I'm thinking. Well, that is why I said frame the, challenge. frame the construct. That's, you know, my one piece of advice to you is 
try framing your construct, explain it at the outset. Hey, don't you agree this is the right way of thinking? Because nothing in what you're saying in terms of your framework, I think is very controversial. So if it's not controversial, but people are doing the opposite, it's because it's not explicit. So make it explicit. And I think you'll see, you're not assuming that they're rational, but but you can get them to be a lot more rational. I'm going to take you up on that, Alex. All right. Uh, and then we'll do a follow-up. <laughs> we'll see how it that, went. That'll, that'll be great. that would be a fun little, I'll, I'll just say I found it unbelievably successful. Uh, my uh, Myself, I do it. And actually people might not know if they go to, um, I guess my Substack, Alex F. Sun on Substack.com. We now have Alex AI. So it's an AI that mimics me really, really well. People can also check it out on the App Store. If you just search probably Alex, Alex Epstein AI, it'll probably come up. Um, but yeah, this framing of things around considering the full context benefits and side effects, it's very powerful because nobody can disagree with it. Excellent. Okay, that's very useful advice. And I hope the listeners and I will definitely take you up on that one. All right, Thanks a lot great. for joining yeah. us today, Alex. Great talking to you. And uh, I hope you'll join me again and we'll do a follow-up. Would love to. Thank you. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Alex Epstein, check out his Substack called Energy Talking Points. Read his books and watch his interviews. And don't forget, please subscribe to this show on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now. And I'll see you next time.